AI, the latest mania, AI in medicine, we would substitute doctors. So, just yesterday we had a new paper about AI in medicine, published on Nature Communications, evaluating the use of large language models to provide clinical recommendations in the emergency department. And mostly, what I've seen most coverage about this is, study reviews limitations of ChatGPT in emergency medicine. When it comes to emergency care, ChatGPT overprescribes. And so, most coverage has been, so to speak, mostly negative, speaking about how medical doctors are still better than AI. And don't get me wrong, I am a medical doctor. But there's one point I think most coverage is missing the fact that we are having this conversation. Because some years ago, it would have been unthinkable to actually consider an artificial intelligence, a software, for example, prescribing medications or decide the next course of clinical action for a patient. It might not have been tried like on a clinical trial, but people are starting to consider it. And so what I read and I read most of these headlines is Rapidly improving AI is slightly worse than medical doctors. Can you see the problem with that logic? So let's dive deeper into it and look at it from a rational point of view. So if we actually go to the paper, to the article, we see that they conducted a study and that basically they want to determine AI's ability to do three things. They use GPT 3.5 Turbo and GPT 4 Turbo which are the best known and most used large language models. Large language models are what I like to call text-to-text -text AI. You input some text, like a question, and it gives back you an answer, so another text. Of course, I'm not going into how they work. There are plenty of good videos about it on YouTube. But for now, they basically selected 10,000 emergency department cases and then asked both ChatGPT and actual resident physicians to determine one, whether the patient should be admitted to the hospital, whether they should order an x-ray radiological investigation, and whether antibiotics should be prescribed. So these were the three criteria they evaluated the AI, the large language models, basically ChatGPT4, against an actual doctor, a resident physician in emergency medicine. And the conclusion here is that, quote, we found that both GPT-4 Turbo and GPT-3.5 Turbo, end quote, of course, GPT-4 was going to perform much better, quote, performed poorly compared to a resident physician, which accuracy scores 8% and 24% respectively, lower than physician on average. Both LLMs tend to be overly cautious in its recommendations with high sensitivity at the cost of specificity, end quote. And here I want to raise two points. The first point is GPT 3.5 performed 24 percentage points worse than a physician. GPT 4, the later version of ChatGPT, performed 8 percentage points worse than a resident physician. So, what you are telling me implicitly is that GPT-4 performed 16 percentage points better than GPT-3. So, of course, I know it doesn't work like this, but just for a moment, let's try to extrapolate the data, assuming that nothing changes, and that, that the next iteration of ChatGPT, GPT-5, will also perform 16 percentage points better than GPT-4. That would mean, if everything worked, it would actually perform 8 percentage points better than a physician. Of course, we're talking about a resident physician here. We're not talking about an emergency medical attending doctor with 30 years of experience, but doesn't have to be better than an attending doctor with 30 years of experience. My point here is, we had a substantial improvement from GPT 3.5 to GPT 4. If this keeps going like this, then GPT 5 would be better than the physician. 
like Dr. John Alcario Fahir from Too Many Papers like to say, don't look at the paper now, look at the paper, two papers down the line, I think it's something like that. What I read from this paper is ChatGPT is getting almost as good as actual medical doctors in prescribing antibiotics and determining admission status to a hospital and ordering radiological investigation. You can call it scary, you can call it promising. What I see here more than the real result is the tendency. The second point I'd like to raise is that they say that both large language models tend to be overly cautious in these recommendations with high sensitivity at the cost of specificity. In discussion's second paragraph, quote, our results suggest that LLMs are overly cautious in their clinical recommendations. Both models exhibit a tendency to recommend intervention and this leads to a notable number of false positive suggestions, end quote. Okay, first consideration here is that, of course, GPT was not... ChatGPT may be an excellent general model, but it's never going to be as good as something that was custom-made for that purpose. And, once again, maybe we don't even need to do something custom-made. Maybe ChatGPT 5 will have generalized artificial intelligence. Who knows? I don't work directly in AI, so let's just wait and see. But the second point is that's what I consider most relevant, is that we already have high sensitivity and low specificity tests. We call them screening tests, like G-dimer, for example, for pulmonary thromboembolism. The fact that a test has a high sensitive to low specificity does not necessarily make it a bad test. You could just, for example, apply AI for screening admission for the AR. I'm not saying this is the right moment to do it, because of course it's not validated, but we could think about this possibility. If it has a very high sensitivity, it has almost no false negatives, then you could just run every patient that comes to the emergency department, for example, through the AI, and ask, should this patient be admitted? And then, if it answers no, you can safely discharge the patient, knowing that the high sensitivity exam turns a negative. Meanwhile, if it says yes, then you ask a medical doctor to validate the result. So this is not exactly a novel approach. We have many double tests, for example, for AIDS and for many other diseases where you first do the screening, and then if the screening comes positive, the high sensitivity test returns a yes, then you go to the high specificity test, for example, Western blot, then you move to the high specificity test. So there's no reason why we couldn't put AI as a test, so to speak. The algorithm with itself would be the first leg of a two-leg process. And I need to also mention, for example, in the introduction, quote, meanwhile, GPT 3.5 turbo responses to patients' health questions on a public social media forum were both preferred and rated as having higher empathy compared to physician responses. End quote. So this is a different paper that was released like two or three months ago, if I'm not mistaken. And perhaps I should cover it on a different video. Also a very interesting topic, a very interesting paper. But the point on that paper is that they evaluated the patient's perception of the response, not necessarily the medical accuracy, which is a problem. But to me, this gives an idea of how this could come into use in future medical practice. Because so far what we have are large language models. We have softwares. We don't have autonomous robots. We don't have, for example, autonomous surgical robots. I'm not saying it's impossible to make one, but we don't have anything like that currently. So, so far, medical examinations and medical procedures must be done by humans, by medical doctors. There is no way software can perform a physical examination. The way I see it, we could move towards a reality in which the physician focuses on examining the patient, for example, and gathering the best information, then the large language model, whether it is ChatGPT or something custom made for this purpose, comes with the best treatment plan and answer patient's questions, for example, and then 
the medical doctor validates, gives his authorization to this treatment and actually performs procedures and surgical treatments, for example. After all, many patients complain, for example, that medical doctors don't spend enough time explaining everything to them. That's sometimes the medical doctor's fault, but not always. Sometimes they are just very busy and there's a lot of things that demand their attention. So, a large language model talking to the patient could be a potential solution to this. Not necessarily to take the medical doctor completely out of the medical patient relation, but rather to offer the patient more options to ask questions and better understand his situation and the options available to him. Also, they mention also here on the introduction, second paragraph, that one of the greatest hardships of validating large language models for clinical use is the fact that it's very hard to obtain clinical data to test these models on because of very stringent, I'm not saying that's wrong, but very stringent patient privacy guidelines, such as HIPAA, for example. So this is naturally a potential pitfall for the development of this technology. And finally, in the penultimate paragraph, they say that, quote, the variation in clinical practice across countries, it's imperative that LLMs are evaluated across different settings to ensure representative performance, end quote. And I absolutely agree with it. Medical systems in the United States, for example, and in many parts of Europe, are very digitalized. Everything is recorded on a computer. That's not necessarily what we have in many countries around the world. There are lots of places where medical records are still stored in paper. So, of course, we are going to have a different situation where we already have very established medical source systems such as, for example, EPIC, and we want to try to implement AI solutions and where we actually have very primitive digital solutions and we will try to come up with something from the ground up. And I'm not necessarily sure which will work better because there is an advantage in just having a clean slate to build upon, but I guess we'll see. And they also talk about attempts to refine the provided prompt, but based on my own experience, that's not that great or significant with ChatGPT and other large language models. Ultimately, the model needs experience. If the model has not been exposed to the situations you want it to solve, then no amount of prompting is going to cause it to return the answer you actually expect. So the take home message for me is a lot of decision making in medicine is already based on algorithm, although paper algorithms. If the patient has blood pressure greater than this, do this. If the patient pressure, blood pressure is lower than this, do this exam. If this exam comes positive, do this. So a lot of emergency medicine, for example, is already based on algorithms. Of course, there is still a lot of judgment reserved for the medical doctor that's there seeing the situation, examining the patient and talking to the patient. But in the end, AI doesn't need to be better than a doctor. It just needs to be good enough because ultimately it's much cheaper than a doctor and you don't necessarily need to send a doctor away to implement AI. You could just implement AI and ask the doctor to supervise the AI. Overall, the way I read it is AI is slightly worse than medical doctors and getting better. Thank you for watching this video. Maybe you should consider watching the next one. I also have some videos from medical art to teaching medical topics. Thank you.